Mary. You can wave at each other there a little bit, huh? A holy, holy wave. In the Bible, there's the holy kiss. We'll call this the holy wave, huh? And I saw some people going like this, right? Uh, <laughs> not really. I didn't see that. But, um, we've been going through the book of Job. I do want to welcome also uh, Kathy Blazinski, uh, Kim, Kim Sinclair in Wisconsin, Sandra Halverson. You know that lady? Uh, that's that's uh, Wade's mom. Uh, Jen Wyland, Angela Knapper, and... Uh, uh, along with those that I've already mentioned. And if you're watching, please join us uh, and let us know that you're on. Thank you for being here. I know we have some people who listen later. Uh, last week we had a pretty big week. I think people snowed in. They must have been bored or something, but we had like 450 views on last week. And it's been running about a couple hundred uh, views. And um, so... Last week we looked at uh, Bildad, and Bildad has been referred to as Bildad the Brutal. He basically uh, confronts Job and tells him that uh, Job's kids are dead because they sin, and he's in this terrible suffering that he's in because of his, of his personal sin, the consequences of it. As you know, and I know most people that have been here have heard this. I'll, I'm going to make it very brief, but Job was a man who feared God, shunned evil. God held him in high esteem, in fact, pointed him out to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody else like him. He was unique uh, because he was so committed to the Lord. And Job had ten children. He had great wealth financial security. He was considered one the greatest man of the East, not one of the greatest men, but the greatest man of the East at that point. And he was well known. He was a godly man. Uh, he had 10 children. He offered sacrifices because he thought perhaps maybe they have sinned in their heart. He was concerned about his kids. And then suddenly, uh, unaware to him what is going on, he loses his finances, his servants, his children, all in one day. And what has transpired is God has allowed Satan to uh, afflict Job in these ways, and Job maintained his integrity. And that was round one. It was over. And then, sometime later, Job comes, and he, uh, or Satan comes to the Lord and is, is there, and God says again, have you considered my servant Job? Even though I was, you moved my hand against you, I allowed you to do this. Yet he still maintains his integrity, and, and Satan says, yeah, but if you let me have a little more rope, if you let me touch him physically, then... He will curse you, God. He will curse you. Well, God says, go ahead, but spare his life. And so Job afflicts him with boils from the top of his head to the tip of his, the bottom of his feet. And he's in great pain. And yet he continues to trust God. His wife, who has gone through all of this great tragedy as well, says to her husband, curse God and die. And I don't know how she said it. Curse God and die. I, don't, I think that's the way we often think. It may have been, curse God and die. He is in such suffering. But he says, oh, will you speak like one of the foolish women? Will we receive uh, good from God, but not evil? And he still maintained his integrity. Another round is over. Job is found sitting on an ash heap, scraping himself, evidently itching, scraping himself with potsherds, pieces, pieces of broken pottery, scraping these boils. He has some friends that have not forsaken him yet. He has some friends. 
In fact, we're told in the book of Job that his friends basically abandoned him. But these three friends planned to come and comfort Job, so they set a time and they met, evidently coming from other places, probably great wealthy men themselves, I'm assuming. And so they come and when they see Job at a distance, they can't even hardly recognize him and they weep. They are broken hearted for him and they sit for seven days and they don't say a thing. And then Job finally opens his mouth and it's like opening a fire hose because all of this pain starts shooting out in the presence of friends that he trusts. And he tells where he is at, how he is struggling. He's not sinning, but he's telling exactly how he feels. Well, one of these friends, three friends, Eliphaz, starts rebuking him. And Job survives. Another round is over. Whoops. I don't know what I dropped there, but it wasn't that important. It's okay. Um, so, I think that might have been my list of people that had joined us. Thank you, Paul. There we go. I'll throw some more stuff and see if he'll do it. <laughs> he survives that round. These, these are his friends. And then Bildad, some have referred to him as Bildad the Brutal. He comes out, the round starts, that's the start. Job has already been beat up by circumstances, by the loss of financial wealth and health. He's been beat up by personal loss with his children. He's been beat up because physically he is in such agony. And then his friend Eliphaz beats him up some more. And there it's like a tag team. You know, if you ever watch uh, the ridiculous wrestling, I would call it, where, um, you know, they are pretending like they're hitting them or whatever <laughs> and throwing them out of the ring. And then there's a tag team. Well, this is truly a tag team. This is not make believe. Eliphaz had failed to basically get Job to finally admit that he must be so sinful that God is judging him. So Bildad comes at it and he says, Job, if you read it, basically he says, Job, your 10 kids are dead because of their sin. And you are in this predicament. You are suffering because of your sin. Just face it and turn from it and turn to God because, and this is what all three of them view. If you have bad things happening to you, it must mean that you are bad. If you have good things happening to you, it must mean you are good. That's basically the principle. If you commit sin, you're going to be judged. And God is judging you, Job. And he's judged your kids. And if you do what is right, you're going to be blessed. God's going to open blessings to you. Now, there is that principle. God does bless those who, who seek him and follow him. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, the longings of your heart. And Job had been a seeker of God, and he was still maintaining his integrity. And that round ends with Bildad, and Job is now in the corner. He's been beat up by another friend, kicked when he was down, cruel. And then the round begins, and out comes Zophar, prancing around. We have seen in the book that Satan was talking to the Lord and we connect him directly with all the tragedy that came in the first round. And we see him with all the tragedy that came in the second round when he lost his health. And ultimately, the great news for us is we're not living 
Job's life, we have seen that God turns it around. Blesses him with twice as much as he had before and has those, these same friends ultimately admit that they're wrong. I will tell you that sometimes you'll see portions of scripture quoted from Job's friends. And it is true. And what most of his, what his friends said is true, but taken totally out of context, misapplied truth. I mentioned last time, like, you go to the doctor and you're, you're um, freezing to death. They dig you out of a snowbank and they hand you a snow cone, you know. <laughs> or you're bleeding profusely. You've cut your hand off, okay? And so let's give him some blood thinner. Let's give him some blood thinner. Wrong. There's a time for blood thinner. In fact, uh, some of you have prayed for my friend Travis that, uh, you know, he stepped in a, uh, out in South Dakota, he was guiding and he stepped in a badger hole in his uh, ALC. Is that right? I usually see, say ACL, you, <laughs> ALC. And um, you know, so, and then he ends up with a blood clot. He was in such agony, they gave him blood thinner. He said that evidently worked because the pain is gone. And that way, there's a time for these things. There's a time for these truths. But this was not the time. They were misapplying it. They were acting as though they knew things that Job himself did not know, that they were superior, that Job was not coming to him at this right conclusion. So far, Job's friend, I thought about this this week. You know, I look forward to meeting people in heaven, loved ones, my grandpa, my dad, especially those two, but I think of others, that Apollos, who was a great expositor and a man who was an apologist in the book of Acts. He was mighty in the writings and the scriptures. I look forward to meeting him. I look forward to, like I said, I don't feel qualified to meet Job because he's something exceptional. In fact, he is referred to in the book of Ezekiel along with Noah and Daniel, great men. He's, of course, referred to in the book of James. He's a real person, Job was. And he's in heaven. Do you know what? So is Eliphaz, Bilidad, and Zophar. I can tell you I'm not too excited about meeting them. In fact, I kind of pictured this week Zophar coming up to me and, or Bildad, the brutal, saying, I really don't like how you represented me in that <laughs> sermon that day. <laughs> or, hi, I'm Zophar. I'm Eliphaz. I'm Bilidad, whatever. But they are there. They were true friends. But ultimately, they had to have Job pray for them. God convicted them. Here is Zophar. If you open up your Bibles to Job chapter 11, you know, suffering and sorrow are things that God uses. I do not like them, but God uses them. I've quoted this before, but I think it's one of the most wonderful truths that Spurgeon stated. He said, the Lord gets his best soldiers out of the highlands of affliction. Someone else has said, night brings out stars as sorrow shows us truth. And McLaren, that Bible commentator, he said, those who know the path to God can find it in the dark. And maybe right now, you're in a dark place. It's a difficult time. That's when we need to make sure that we're trusting in Jesus Christ. We look to him, where else are we going to go? Job was in that situation. And so here, Zophar steps out. And he, first of all, we'll see, assumes Job is suffering because of his sin. And then he adds a little bit more to it. And that his words are actually adding to his sin. Verses 1 through 3 of Job 11 then Zophar, Zophar, the Namathite, replied, Are all these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? You know, we know that 
his two friends, but we also know there was another man that we'll cover later. He was there too, a younger man. I don't know how many people were sitting around and listening to these arguments. You know, when you think of the book of Job, we're not going to hit every verse by any means. We're not just not going to do that. But you can listen to it. It takes a couple hours. I've listened to the book a uh, number of times. I go on a drive, I stick it on, BibleGateway.com, listen to the whole book. And here's Zophar. He also assumes that Job is suffering. The other two, Eliphaz and Bildad, had not been able to get Job to the point of admitting that he's got some kind of sin because that is the only explanation. Have you ever been accused of something you were not guilty of? I remember uh, kind of a sad time. I told some of you this, but uh, we were on a camping trip, and we had, we were in, um, we'd stopped at Wall Drug, and we camped overnight there, and we had the old pop-up camper we bought from Best Folks for $400, and it was 20 years old when we got it, and we had it for about 15 years, and then I had to pay somebody to take it away, you know. Uh, we had a, a vehicle lose its transmission, but we were in Wall Drug, and we loaded up, and each of the girls had their responsibility. You know, there's these bars, that you, poles that you take off. And uh, then we got to uh, Buffalo, Wyoming. And we went up into the, um, I think we were by uh, Meadowlark Lake. And it was raining, and so we told the girls to get in, stay in the car, and we, we put the camper together quick, and uh, we found out. Some of those, a couple of those poles were missing. So I chewed out grace. You had the response. I put it in there. Well, you evidently didn't because it's not here. We have video of, from even, I think, across the lake, uh, looking at the campsite. Later, we looked at the video. When we had to move from there, we lowered it down, and here were the bars sitting on top. I had put them on top, or one of us had, I think probably me, and we cranked it up so we couldn't see it. We had the video, you could see them shining over there. And I apologize, they even got my knees and asked Grace to forgive me because she was not guilty of doing anything. Have you ever been in that position? You know, sometimes because of pressure, there are people who are brought in for certain crimes that they didn't commit, but they finally just give up just to get to end the thing. And I don't know how often that happens. But here was Job. They're trying to get him to say, Job, you know that there's sin in your life. Well, he obviously had had God search him, say, what have I done? And probably one of the most painful things is to be go, have something happen to you and you don't know why it's happening to you. You know, there's been people that have been molested. And I remember a, uh, a fellow at uh, Asbury Seminary, and he shared during a chapel that he was a young boy fishing, and a man came and molested him. And for the rest of his life, up to that point, he'd been wondering, what's wrong with me that he picked me? What's wrong with me? Well, Job was walking in the light that he had, but he had friends telling him there must be something wrong. And the way Zophar is talking about him, will, you idle, will your idle talk reduce others to silence in verse 3? Well, verse 2, are, are all these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? Will, you, will your idle talk reduce others to silence? Will no one rebuke you when you mock? But where he says... Are all these words to go unanswered? Is this talker to be vindicated? One of the most painful things that I have ever experienced is to be talked about like a piece of furniture. It is a painful thing. Some of you remember many years ago we went through a real difficult time and we had these curtains in the basement that were pulled and, and these and even people that I knew that even when they were saying good things about me, you could hear every single group talking to be talked about 
like a piece of broken furniture is probably one of the most painful things I have ever experienced. And some of you have experienced it. Maybe it was a spouse that would denigrate you in front of others. Well, you know, she, or, you know, he always, or she does, you know, when you're talking in that third person, as though you are no longer human, you've been dehumanized. This is part of what Zophar was doing. You see, Job had experienced Satan's wrath through all the loss, financial, his family, and then through the physical. But Satan was not through. We don't see him, but he is in the thoughts and ideas that are being used against him at this moment. I had a roommate, uh, Wes, and a wonderful roommate, and Wes and Abel, both from Sri Lanka. They were cousins, and uh, Abel was my sweet mate, wonderful man. He's now the district superintendent for like 120 churches or something like that out in New York. And uh, Wes is, was a fabulous preacher. And um, I heard the stories from them in Sri Lanka that Chris, Wes's dad, and Abel's uncle, had a real deliverance ministry that I said, well, how do you know when somebody's demon-possessed? He was often contacted, and the stories, the supernatural stories, I had heard about this, and, and uh, both of them. And, and a Wes had gone wrong with his dad on, a, on a, some of these things. And, I mean, there, there's a, a supernatural element, darkness, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And I asked Chris, it was on graduation day, and so his family was there. And I asked Chris, who was a pastor at the time, he's now retired, and he'd come to the United States. I said, why don't we see that type of activity here? I mean, what, what's Satan doing here? And he said, well, he said, he is just as active, but he works through philosophies and theologies and through ideas that are wicked, more than just the overt. I had another friend who went to India, and when he came back, he said, my eyes were open. I saw Satan working in two different ways. In India, he's trying to tell people he's all-powerful, and here in the United States, he's trying to tell people he doesn't exist. Well, here is Zophar. You know, one did the, this, uh, Zophar did one of the most demeaning things a person can experience, and that is to, be spoken in, of in the third person. It's one thing to be slandered by overhearing a conversation when those talking do not realize that you're hearing what they say. I've heard, I've experienced this. It's horrible. However, to have someone talk in your presence as if you're not even there is really a way of dehumanizing the individual. So far talks as if, if Job were worthless, and that's what he says. He says, you're trying to vindicate yourself. The Lord sometimes allows his servants to be publicly humiliated by other believers. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, was humiliated. He did nothing wrong. I think of the Apostle Paul. He was certainly humiliated. He said, we are considered the off-scouring of the earth, the apostles are. However, in the end, the Lord confronts and corrects Zophar. They are talking to Job and trying to correct him and God will ultimately correct them. There are times when we believers may try to vindicate ourselves, but we'll be criticized for attempting to do so, and that's what was taking place with Job. Zophar evidently accused Job of trying to do this with his talk, trying to vindicate himself. Zophar was basically saying that Job should shut his mouth. Indeed, there are times when the Lord's vindication is needed by God's servants, not just for the sake of that servant, but for that servant's witness and for the sake of those who, who that individual is seeking to influence. You know, this is the tragedy when a person is walking with the Lord and then there's gossip and slander. They are hindering that ministry. God takes that very seriously. Zophar assumes Job is suffering because of his sin and that Job's words are actually adding to it. You know, it's natural for a person who is being falsely accused of something to try to vindicate oneself. 
since Job was being falsely accused, it was natural for him to try and, and do this. You know, David frequently cried out to God for vindication, and maybe that's where you're at. You need to be vindicated. Maybe you need to be vindicating your family. Maybe you be, need to be vindicated at work. Maybe you need to be vindicated uh, uh, with your loved ones or friends. David frequently cried out. In Psalm 7, 8, he said, Let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. David cried out for vindication. Again, David prayed in Psalm 17, 1 to 2. Hear me, Lord, my plea is just listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. In Psalm 54, 1 and 2, David prayed, Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. And David had confidence, and he also stated this. In Psalm 138, verse 8, The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Evidently, there were times when David felt abandoned, forsaken, in fact, Psalm 22, we know this very well, where David said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was true in David's life, and then later, Jesus also stated that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? And ultimately, he was forsaken for our sake. Well, I think of... Job here, crying out for vindication. You know, the Lord spoke through David in Psalm 37, 4 to 6, and this is what he promised. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness, righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the new day sun. Isaiah the prophet, and please, if you are in that position, this is a really important passage. Isaiah 54, 17 no weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. You know, in this book, we'll eventually see that God vindicates. It wasn't his friends. It wasn't Job wasn't able to vindicate himself. His friends weren't able to vindicate him. But who vindicated him? God did. In the end, God speaks to Eliphaz, who was evidently the oldest, and says, you and your two buddies, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, Tom Rako translation, hey, you and your two buddies have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So I tell you what, you go and you offer these sacrifices and you ask Job to pray for you, and then I'll listen. I mean, they are very committed to bringing Job to a point where he says, yes, I've sinned, finally. I've, I've sinned, yes, it's there. He knows he's a sinner. But there was not some secret hidden sin that was causing all this turmoil upon him. And as I said, one of the most painful things is not knowing why. Why? In the end, we know that Job was vindicated, not by himself and certainly not by his friends, but Job was vindicated by God himself. So far, first of all, as we saw, he, he assumes Job is suffering because of his sin. Zophar assures Job that he should be suffering more than he currently is. So think of all that Job went through, and Zophar says, Job, <laughs> God's not even giving you all that you deserve. You're such a wicked man. You're evil. That's basically what he's saying. Look at verses 4 through 6. You say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I am pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak. This is Ophar talking now. That he would open his lips against you and to close to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Self-righteous individuals are often quick to call others self-righteous. Uh, Ray Steadman, he tells, uh, he's gone to be with the Lord, but he told about a certain magazine, Christian magazine he subscribed to that came, and he 
in that, in that uh, magazine one month was an article by the editor. Billy Graham had been hospitalized, and the editor said, God is judging him because he associates with these liberal people, and he is sick because God is judging him. And then Ray Steadman said, what was interesting is the next month's issue, the editor had fallen down the stairs and broke his leg. And he said it was Satan trying to stop his great work, you know, as an editor of the magazine. Well, really, this is what Job's friends are saying. They're saying, this is all happening to you because of your sinfulness. Sadly, sometimes those who profess to be our friends actually hope the worst for us. If you were, if you were Job, would you want three? These are, his, these are the best. <laughs> we know that there are others that just abandoned him. They were scoffing. They were making fun of him. These were the best that he had at this point. <clears throat> Zophar also uh, assesses Job's severe limitations. Look at 7 to 12. He says, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. Now, this is true. This is all truth here. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Here's Zophar telling Job, you don't know anything, Job. Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. He comes along and confines you in prison and convenes the court. Who can oppose him? Surely he recognizes deceivers. See, this is, this is the real cut here. He recognizes deceivers. He's saying, Job, God knows you're a deceiver. And when he sees evil, does he not take note? Job, he's seen your evil, and he's taken note. But the witless man no more become wise than a wild donkey's colt can be born human. It's not going to happen. He talks about the severe limitations of Job. The mysteries of God are too great for Job to fathom. The extensive limits of God are too great for Job to probe. Zover asked, what can you do? What do you know? And can God be opposed? God cannot be measured or compared to anything in creation. He's far beyond any human measure or, or comparison. God sees evil, and God does take note. All these things are true, but he's really speaking down to Job. And then he advises him to turn back to God. He thinks he's this great evangelist or something. He says, Job, God has seen your sin the fact is, I don't have these things happening to me. I still have all my family. The self-righteousness is a disgusting thing to God. I think that's why God, we're told, he was angry at these friends. Because they had basically caught more, caused more pain to Job than he needed. Zophar advises Job to turn back to God, and then all will be well with him. He promises God's blessings, and God does bless when we turn to him. He does this. This is truth. This is reality. But as I said before, it's misapplied. A man that has a wound with infection, and so the doctor just says, let's bandage it up good. Let's not get rid of the infection. Let's not clean it up. We'll just bandage it all up. Wrong treatment for what's there. He says in verses 13 and 19, Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you free of fault you will be. You will lift up your face. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as water's gone by. Life will be brighter than noonday. And darkness will become like morning. You will be secure because there is hope. You will look back, look about you, and take your rest in safety. You will lie down with no one to make your, you afraid. And many will court your favor, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gas. Job, if you turn to God, all these great things are going to happen. But if you don't, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. We see that Zophar promised that every area of Job's life would be tremendous. And I just want to touch just on a few things here in the chapters that follow, because now Job responds back. Look at Job chapter 12. 
Then Job replied, Doubtless you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. But I have a mind as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Who does not know all these things? First of all, he uh, is also, he's not inferior. He says, I know these things. I know what you said. I'm not stupid. I, I know, I understand these things. And then look at verses uh, four, three and four. He says, I have become a laughing stock to my friends. Those are the rest of the friends. I have become a laughing stock to my friends. Have you ever had people laughing about you? I've told this before, but years ago, after we went through this very difficult thing, depression, and I went to the post office. And many years have passed, decades have passed now. I went to the post office, and I went on Saturday at about 1 o'clock because I didn't want to see anybody. In fact, you can ask my wife. Sometimes I had a hard time even bothering to brush my teeth. One time I was spinning out during that time. I didn't shower or shave for three days, didn't brush my teeth for three days. She couldn't get me out of it. So what did she do? She called up some missionary friends and invited them over without me knowing about it. <laughs> they show up at the door. No, my, so I end up, I showered. And she, sometimes that helps you, got me out of it. And these missionaries had gone through great suffering that they had experienced in another country. He says, I have become a laughing stock. Well, one of those times at the, I went into the post office at like 1 o'clock, went to get my mail. And I hear these two people laughing on the other side. One was a f postmaster many years ago. We've had some great postmasters. She was the postmaster and someone else who had worked there before. And they were laughing and they were talking about me and about the church. I thought, God, how cruel can you be? I am down and now it's like the knife is being turned. I got my little mail, and I was just going to kind of crawl out of there, creep out of there. And God said, you let them know that you heard this. I don't want to do that. But I did. Who's there? From the other side. I said, one of the people you're talking about. And she opened the door, and she said, oh, he's dropping. He's, he's, uh, Dropping. Is that what you call it? I said, no, I was just getting my mail. But I wonder how many times this has happened over the years and nobody said anything. And the other man, honestly, he, he's gone, he's passed away since then. But tears began running down his eyes and he said, Pastor Tom, I'm so sorry. Two different responses. Oh, what did happen? The other one said, I said, not what you said, not what you're saying. Job has become a laughing stock. He says, I have become a laughing stock to my friends, not to my enemies, but to my friends. Though I called upon God and he answered, God had answered Job's prayers. A mere laughing stock, though righteous and blameless. And then he confronts them just quickly here. The, look at verse uh, 6. They have said, well, if bad things happen to you, it's because you're bad. Then he says this, the tents of marauders are undisturbed. And those who provoke God are secure. Those who carry their God in their hands. He said, if you look, you'll see wicked people aren't always suffering. Idolaters are not always suffering. He's arguing against their theology, their philosophy. And ultimately, he comes to uh, uh, one of the, uh, and I'm just going to close with this, because you think of all that Job has gone through, and you can read his responses through, ch through chapter 14, but over in chapter 13, here's what he says. Verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. He is still trusting God despite all of this. Guess what? 
The round is over. Job has had three friends that have beat him up and down and fought dirty, and he's still standing. And no matter what you may be going through, no matter what you may be struggling with, when you put your hope in him, in the end, God will bless you. You may get to see it in this life. I think usually you do get to see a turnaround. But if not, you'll see it on the other side. Amen? Amen. Amen. This time we'll have our last song. Thank you, Pastor Tom. That last verse, that's a whole wonderful sermon in itself, isn't it? Someday you'll be preaching on that, I hope. Anyway, thank you. We're going to close with Be Still My Soul. song psalm 46 10 he says be still and know that i am god i will be exalted among the nations i will be exalted in the earth and so we can rest in him trust in him let's uh 
close in prayer, I want to thank you for joining us. And as we close out in prayer, we'll be praying for you as well. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you that you are in control. I thank you for Job's life, Lord. It was a unique situation that a cross that you gave him for our sake so that when we experience difficulties, it doesn't mean we're going to experience what he experienced by any means, but when we do and we're bewildered and nobody understands, we can trust you. Though he slay me, as Job did, though he slay me, yet shall I hope in him, trust in him. Lord, I, I am not sure I can say that, but we know Job did, and we can aspire to it. We can trust you, and you've called us to keep trusting you, to walk by faith, not by sight, not by what we see happening around us, but what you have called us to do, and then to be put our hand to the plow and not look back. Anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's what you said, Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help each one here, each one watching, that they might fully and completely, and I pray this for myself, commit themselves and myself to you, that you will guide us, you will direct us, that you will help us. We need your help, Lord. And there's those that are watching right now that have gone through sleepless nights and difficulties, struggles. Maybe nobody else knows about it, but you do. And Lord, we can, you've called us to help individuals. And so if somebody's watching and they need help, maybe it's a long ways away. We can, we can still do it by phone or help them in some way. Thank you for this music and thank you for your word, which is living and powerful. Thank you for those that are here, those that are watching, that we can join together in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.